Welcome back, everyone. I am Lynn Gilliland, and this is Lessons from Leaders. This podcast is hosted by LG Consulting as well as Humentum. And I am so happy to have Cheryl here, who's the executive director. She is, it's so, well, we'll get into it with you, Cheryl, but she's the um, executive director for an alliance that's both a uh, World Wildlife Foundation and CARE. And so there's so much in this to unpack, and I'm so glad you had the time to come talk to us. So welcome. Thank you. Very happy to be here talking with you. And just to let's jump in with our both feet. Um, just a second ago, we were talking about how for you, how important is collaboration and inclusion? And we are using those words a lot right now. So talk about tell us tell us what you what you're what you're thinking about what why these are important to you um you know what you're aspiring to attain does that make sense sure. i can talk about collaboration and inclusion on a couple of different levels we were talking about it in the sense of the partnership so the alliance is this long-standing partnership between care and wwf or wildlife fund and tried to manage two large organizations to come together in such alliance. The focus really has to be on collaboration and inclusion. And I think that that is really the key to, to any partnership. But I, I think particularly when you have such large organizations, so you have many teams within both organizations that need to be in a, a wide range of discussions. They don't necessarily always need to be in the decisions, but they need to be included. They need to feel a part of the program. They need to help shape the program, right? We have wide ranging expertise on both sides that are really important and are really honestly the crux, right, of why these organizations came together. So my role is really spending a lot of time having conversations and circling back to people to make sure everybody is up to date on what we're doing, that they feel included, that they have that space to be able to voice their opinion, their ideas, their their expertise to, to shape our work. I think that when we think about leadership styles, I, I really try to focus on collaboration. I, I look for collaborators. I like to collaborate. I really feel that we, we are stronger together, right? That is how we create a greater impact is by linking all of our, our different work and to recognize that there are areas of competition, but to try to find that collaboration within those spaces as well, right? I mean, CARE and WWF also have spaces where they could collaborate, but finding those areas and then looking at them in that sort of collaborative lens where we can figure out how we can be strengthening each other's work and really leveraging each other's work, I think is, is the key. I could also talk about um, inclusion, you know, and collaboration with our community work, but, um, but we can get to that later. So just, yeah, and that, that made me, I was going to ask one question, then uh, my mind went to, is that different, the inclusion and collaboration with the communities that we work with? But let's put that there and we'll come back to it. So how do you know if you've been successful with inclusion? Like what's this, what's the sign that, okay, this is what I, I have achieved, what I have set out to do? What's the results that you're looking for? I think that it would be something best measured in qualitative mm -hmm. right, review, but I think it's really people's excitement about the program, mm -hmm. bringing in different ideas, having this sort of diversity of ideas that come together, things that don't necessarily always come together, right, to be part of one program. I think it's people's desire to work with each other. We recently held a workshop in Zambia for our new program called Sewing Change, and we brought together the WWF and the care teams, and they were so excited to work with each other and really saw that space where that partnership would strengthen their own work and that they could come together to create something new and exciting together. And there's such a positive energy and momentum, right, and initiative 
to create something that to me was really success. And so I think in, in all of the relationships that are part of the Alliance, that's really, to me, the biggest indicator that people want to be a part of this, that they're excited about it, that they have new ideas that they want to bring to it. So what that gave me was with con con inclusion and collaboration, we, we are, we get great ideas. We get excitement. We get energy. It's, it's there's a end game mm, that I mean, that's not the right word but there's like the it it's the the fuel that drives us to a better outcome it, is that what, yes putting words in your mouth or that's that <laughs> for you those are good words yes i mean i i think you need that in a partnership Right? right partnerships come together for a reason right yeah. for us it is that there is this wide range of expertise that's needed for a lot of the conflicts challenges that we face. I think climate change is always the greatest example, right? Where you need right. your WWF has this great expertise on climate science, on landscape restoration, on so many different, you know, landscape science approaches. CARE has this great expertise in livelihoods, in gender programming, in community-based work. And to me, to really address climate change and all of the sort of multiple levels of challenges that we're facing, we need everybody to come together. And so mm -hmm. we have all the outcomes identified that we want to be working towards, but we need that desire to work together and that recognition, right, of the importance of each other's skills and complementarity of their skills to make the partnership work that can ultimately drive those outcomes. And so your job as the leader is to help cultivate that, create the space for that to, you know, be the farmer watering the seeds of that. Yeah? Yes. I would say my role is really to be looking within both organizations to see, first, how we can be strengthening what's already going on, right? Both, mm -hmm. both organizations have all of this amazing programming mm. that has sort of points of intersection with each other. And so looking for those spaces where we can bring in that partnership to make those programs even stronger. And then the second part would be to bring together all of those range of skills to create something new that neither organization can do on their own, but can only do by working together. And that's a new program that we're putting together called Sewing Change that's really focused on, you know, landscape restoration and working with young women to ensure that they have those access to resources, to skills, to information that they need right, to be part of that green economy that's growing, to be part of all of the climate decisions that are going on that, that affect the lives. It is, I, I just think it's so, that sounds so exciting to me to, to, to be, you know, going, breaking new ground and bringing these powerhouses of organizations together and the people that work for them. And um, I, it just sounds like, I know it can be, I have no doubt it's challenging because they're two separate organizations, but how fun to see what you can create from that. What an opportunity. Um, so, yeah, that's what was coming up for me when you were talking. So you've been in this position two-ish years, right? Almost two years, yeah. So what, um, what have you, what was the unexpected learnings that you have or what do you, what do you, What's it pulling out of you as a leader that m maybe you didn't anticipate or or you have to bring more of it than you used to bring in other positions? Or? I would say a few things. I would say uh, I love I love being in the middle more than I knew that I would be. So by training, I am a conservation biologist, but I have always worked community-based conservation and i've spent the last eight or nine years working at a health organization bringing in conservation so i love this nexus mm. of sort of community development and conservation and i think that that's such an important space honestly for both sides i think that conservation as a sector should really be thinking about communities and um, how their programming affects different genders i think that the development community should really be thinking about natural resource management and the sustainability of the livelihoods that they're promoting. So I love that opportunity to bring these together. And I think having two major leaders in both fields 
mm. does feel does feel like a, a huge opportunity, right? It is. Um, I, I think some people ask why would, why would those two organizations come together, but it really creates this massive opportunity to create this big change at scale, right? That you don't always have access to. So I think that that's probably the first part. I think the second part, which is is pretty fascinating as well, is they're very different organizations. And so from an organizational learning standpoint, you can see how different things are done in different organizations sort of in real time and make those comparisons. And I, I think that part is also quite honestly very fascinating and it and it allows you to sort of bring, you know, the the learnings from each side to each other, right? Like, oh, I've seen this done really well at this organization, or I've seen this really done done well over here, and you know, maybe it's an idea to consider. So, I, I love that cross organizational learning opportunity hmm. as well, which okay. I didn't expect. That's yeah. interesting. I, that that um, I, that's a th I hadn't imagined that, but that could be like you're the bumblebee or the hummingbird spreading. <laughs> maybe a bumblebee spreading the pollen around that otherwise might just stay it care or WWF. So that's cool. Yeah. I think we get, we get stuck in sort of our organizational patterns and sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to see that they can be done differently in different places. Right. And so we sort of forget to bring that learning in and then adapt. And you would have to be skilled in how you share so yes. that it, it's seen as a as you're just you know as a positive not as a so that people because we are always looking for being judged so as a positive as a additional idea as opposed to they're doing it better than you so that that takes some <laughs> diplom diplomacy also yeah yes although i would say i i find in general i think that most of my colleagues, I don't know if this is a generalization for mission-based work in general, but most people want to do their best in this work, mm -hmm. right? They want to be learning constantly. I think we do have really strong learning cultures in both organizations. They want to be hearing about different ideas, mm -hmm. right? And I and I don't think that most people take it as like, oh, this is not going well here, but rather like these are different ways that we could think about trying out ideas and I think most people respond positively to to that type of opportunity. I'm also going to lay some of it at your feet. It is I'm sure it has also to do with your ability to to share and how you express it. So that probably helps too. So just say yes, that's possible. I'm trying. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> so um I told you earlier, one of my favorite things to talk about is failure, mostly because I struggle with it as for my own self. So I like to ask people, you know, what what do you think about failure as a leader? And so there's one one way we think about it theoretically. Yes, failure is wonderful. Fail fast, fail often. And then there's like when it happens and how how we manage it. So do you, what thoughts do you have about either your own areas that you have not have not worked out the way that you had the results you intended or, or organizationally? I think failure is difficult. I think it's only fair to recognize that right on an individual level, it's very difficult. I think when you look at it institutionally, it's easier to mm -hmm. be more um, evaluative in, in what happened. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the, things that we're trying to really focus on in the Alliance. So when I joined, we had sort of a relaunch of the Alliance, mainly because we're launching this new global program and they hadn't had anyone sort of sitting, uh, leading the Alliance 100% before and, and sitting in both organizations. So we call it sort of our relaunch. And as part of our relaunch, we've really been looking at what have we done in the past? What's worked well, what hasn't done? Has, hasn't been as effective as we wanted it to be. And sort of looking forward. And I think one of our areas that we would really like to focus on looking forward is really learning. Because I do think, as we look at sort of the global sort of e ecosystem of NGOs and different organizations working in this conservation and development space, I think this is time. It's been time for a while, in my opinion, for all of us to sort of shift our roles right, to not necessarily be doing 
direct implementation, but mm -hmm. to be looking at where can we be most effective given where we work, where we have access to resources, I mean, that kind of thing. And I think one of the spaces where we can be really effective is learning, right? We have access to a great number of different amazing research institutions. We have access to these global programs where we can pull in data and look at them. We have access to these different types of partnerships where we can be working with them to look at their data. And so I think it should be an area that we focus on is looking at how we are constantly learning and part of that includes our failures. And part of that is programmatic, part of that is management, part of that is institutional. I definitely think the institutional and the management are harder right, to, right. to deal with, but I think equally important. And I think we continue to learn, right? But I, but I also, I, I will say that I find it inspiring in the sense of a lot of times those failures really help you see things for the future much better than you think, right? I will have more opportunities to do this this way next time and let's see how that works, right? And so I, I find that exciting. I try to keep it in that viewpoint, I think. I think that's very useful the way you frame that and trying to remember I think always that it's just moving us forward even if it didn't work out the way we thought because we've gathered information yeah and when you think about your own leadership journey what what advice would you give your younger self like what do you know now that back in the day whenever that was you you wish that you had known or advice you would give yourself? Oh, it's such a long list. Uh, if I were to, <laughs> I were to try to narrow, I think it would be a few things. I think it would be relationships are really important. Relationships are the most important, right? When And I'm dating myself here, but obviously when I was starting in my career we didn't have Facebook and LinkedIn and all these ways to keep in touch with people and uh, I'm not really a big social media person but what I do love about LinkedIn for example is, is just the ability to stay in touch with people and learn from what they're doing and I think that there were a lot of missed opportunities when I was younger because I didn't realize how valuable relationships in general were and how they should be lifelong, right? And you can continue to grow and learn and be in these relationships for your whole lives, right? And so I, I think really paying attention to that. I think also uh, knowing that there's no wrong decision, in my opinion, in your career path. My career path is not linear in any way. And when I was making some of my decisions when I was younger, I certainly had some advisors telling me that I was on the wrong path. Mm. I, when I graduated from college, I moved to New Zealand and I just really wanted to learn about ethnobotany. That was really my whole goal and it was before the internet, sadly. And so I just moved there blindly. It, and my advisors told me that's the, you know, the worst decision of your life. And of course, it was one of the best decisions of my life. And you really just have to know that all these decisions sort of and choices give you experiences and learnings, right? That ultimately shape what you want to be doing. And it, and it doesn't have to be right a linear path. And there doesn't have to be right and wrong paths. It can just all be part of your story as you go. I, I like that a lot. I like that in some ways I would, you know, whatever you're doing is going to move you forward and it isn't right. there I, there aren't any wrong steps you know um That's right. so and i i know that people really struggle uh, young people especially as do some of us with making yes. the wrong decision so but what if that wasn't a problem what if there aren't wrong decisions so I love the New Zealand story. When I graduated from grad school, my advisor told me not to take the job that I was being offered because the pay was too low. But I took it anyways because I needed to. <laughs> but I have no no regrets. That's worked out perfectly, and everything led to everything. So that, that's, that's right. Yeah. Everything led to everything. That's exactly right. 
Yeah. So, Cheryl, thank you so much for being on. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would, would want to add about leadership, your own leadership journey? I think, first, thank you for having me. So lovely to be here. I, I love talking about the Alliance. I will say I'm, I think one of the things that I'm so fortunate for, and I never take for granted, is that I love my work. I love what I do. I love who I work with. And I think that that is such a driving force for me to get out of bed every day, right? And to continue to do what I do. I would say that, um, you know, leadership is something to me that we should spend more time talking about with younger people to mm. have them feel more comfortable as leaders, because I think that we have a lot of young, amazing people who don't always feel that authority to feel like a leader. And yet, I think that we would do the world good to, to start making young people feel like leaders in their own right, right? You don't have to be in your 40s, 50s, and 60s to be a leader, right? You can be a leader right out of college. You can be a, a leader, you know, as a, as a teenager. And I think that we don't really spend enough time talking about that and, and thinking about that and sort of creating that for our youth. So that would be my part of the time for leadership. I, I agree with that. That's that's fabulous. So thank you again for being on for the work, actually also for the work that you're doing. I'm very excited to see where you guys take this. And um, yeah, we will have you back so we can hear how's it going. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. I look forward to it. And thanks everyone for this episode of Lessons from Leaders. 